Hello everyone um, and welcome um, to the Integrated Quantum Photonics Grand Challenges and Future Directions webinar um, and this is um, from J Photonics and um, IOP Publishing. Uh, we have some really fantastic speakers with us today, um, including Galen Moody, um, Volker Sorga, um, Val Zwiller, John Bowers and Eleni Diamanti. Um, so thank you everybody so much for agreeing to speak at the, um, at the webinar today. Uh, so I am called Kate Porter and I am the publisher of, uh, of JFIS Atonic. So I'd just like to say a few words about, about the journal before we, before we kick off. Um, so uh, JFIS Photonics is a brand new gold open access journal from IOP Publishing and um, the journal is fully interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary which really reflects research today. The journal showcases the most significant and exciting advances in research into the properties and applications of light. Our editor-in-chief is Professor Hugo Tiempont, and he is supported by a really fantastic editorial board, and you can see a few of the members um, on, this, on the slide here. The journal has been accepted into Scopus and the Emerging Sources Citation Index, and we anticipate our first impact factor next year in 2022. We've launched lots of really exciting initiatives on the journal, um, including the Emerging Leaders Collection and the Research Updates Programme. Um, so uh, you can visit um, the web page below for, for more information on these different series. We've also launched our roadmap programme and the first roadmap to be published is the Integrated Quantum Photonics Roadmap, um, which has been guest edited by Galen Moody and Volker Sorga. And this really inspired the, the webinar today. Um, so if you have any questions about JFIS Photonics, please do not hesitate to contact us via the email address uh, below. And um, again, thank you everybody so much for attending this webinar. And um, I will hand you over to Galen, who will be doing um, the, the first talk today. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Kate. Um, let me uh, get my slides sharing. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, okay, so uh, thank you for the introduction. I am Galen Moody. I'm an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering at, at UC Santa Barbara in California. Um, and I'll be presenting today really just an overview of the roadmap on integrated quantum photonics, a recent sort of a review uh, in forward looking article that um, I and a number of very uh, excellent co-authors have put together discussing the grand challenges and future directions of integrated quantum photonics. Um, so I'd like to, to thank IOP and JFIS Photonics uh, for the opportunity to put together the roadmap, um, as well as the sponsors of uh, this webinar. Let me see if I can get my pointer up. Uh, so in the roadmap article, we sort of uh, begin with a timeline of uh, sort of the field of integrated quantum photonics. It's a really young field. It really began in about 2008 with a demonstration of two photon interference on chip. And in the last decade or so, we've seen some really remarkable uh, progress and amazing advances in integrated quantum photonics with uh, sort of prototype small scale demonstrations of quantum photonic processing in this past year. Uh, quantum dot boson sampling, eight photon processing, and large scale arrays of emitters integrated on chip, as well as integrated multi wavelength and multi ion quantum logic. All of this sort of demonstrated in the past year or two. So there's been some really remarkable progress uh, this past decade. And uh, in the next 10 to 15 years or so, um, I think we're going to see some really amazing progress as well. Uh, so here's a really nice image taken from Optica, or formerly OSA's OIDA report on quantum photonics. And this graph here uh, shows uh, uh, sort of the anticipated start date of the commercialization of different technologies over the next 15 years or so. Uh, and so this is across three different areas, including sensing, communications, and computing. And you can see that many technologies are already being commercialized by a number of different companies globally already. What I'd really like to point out with this plot is that 
um, sort of in, in about 10 years, uh, I think the community really expects that we're going to be developing the quantum internet, as well as maybe 10 to 15 years fault tolerant gate based uh, quantum computing. And that may be a, a little bit ambitious, but I think that we're really on track to be able to, to demonstrate some of these uh, technologies and commercialize these technologies. And there's uh, very large investments uh, sort of globally to commercialize these technologies. And I think the reason for that is that the market is gonna be really big. And so already in 2020, the market size for these three different areas is approaching about half a billion dollars. And I think that um, sort of the, the forecasts vary quite a bit for what's gonna happen in the next decade, but these markets are going to grow upwards of towards maybe $50 billion in uh, the next decade or so. And so I think this is really driving a lot of the research and development and commercialization of quantum photonic and integrated quantum photonic technologies. And of course, I think one of the main reasons for this is that these technologies are going to impact a large number of users and uh, a number of different markets. And this includes fundamental research, medical industry, finance and business, transportation infrastructure, and networking. And so across these three different sectors, we can uh, expect to um, develop technologies for confidentiality and cryptography, uh, computing for discovering new materials and, and new drugs, as well as optimization, and then uh, technologies for improved imaging and uh, more precise timekeeping for navigation and GPS, for example. And I think a lot of uh, the development of these technologies and their impact is being accelerated um, because of integrated photonic technologies. And so on this table, it's a little bit busy, but let me just walk you through what's, what uh, I'm showing on this table. In this first column, these are different uh, technologies that are being developed um, for different quantum applications, including photonic qubits, trapped ions and neutral atoms, defect centers, spins, superconducting and topological qubits, and then different applications such as quantum key distribution, uh, timekeeping, and remote and, and local sensing. And each one of these different quantum technologies or applications are already being impacted or will be impacted by different integrated photonic components. And so I show a number of different components here, for example, uh, pump lasers, quantum light sources and single photon detectors, modulators, tunable interferometers, quantum frequency conversion, and memories and, and quantum repeaters. And so each one of these different photonic technologies will likely end up impacting and accelerating the development of these different quantum technologies. And this is really what the roadmap on integrated uh, quantum photonics that we've developed um, really covers both the challenges and the future directions for these different photonic and quantum technologies. And so we have 26 different contributions that cover these different areas. And so I'd like to give an example of just a couple of these from the roadmap article. Uh, so I'm plotting here uh, the number of integrated photonic components on a single chip uh, as a function of the year for applications in, in quantum photonics. And there's a very nice contribution uh, from a group at the University of Bristol um, that discusses both this work and going beyond silicon. And so what you can see is a, a nice exponential growth starting from about a, a few integrated photonic components on chip in 2012 up to almost a thousand components integrated onto a single chip just a couple of years ago. So you, there's some very nice sort of uh, remarkable advances that are being made um, that then impact a number of different technologies for integrated quantum photonics. And one of these is uh, in quantum computing. And so on this graph, um, I'm showing uh, on this axis, uh, the number of qubits for different quantum technologies that have been developed versus uh, a timeline on the, the X axis. So you can see starting before the year 2000, just a couple of decades ago, the development of superconducting qubit technology, um, starting with just a couple of qubits upwards of now uh, over uh, 100 uh, superconducting qubits on chip. A little bit more recently, the development and now commercialization of trapped ion technology with tens of qubits uh, integrated uh, uh, as shown in this, uh, this nice graphic here. And then uh, just in the past couple of years, we've seen this uh, sort of tremendous uh, growth of integrated quantum photonic technologies enable at least small scale prototypes of uh, quantum photonic computers uh, with commercialization done by uh, companies such as PsyQuantum and Xanadu with uh, eight qubits on a single chip uh, just uh, this past year. Um, in addition to sort of integrated photonics uh, for photonic quantum computing, integrated photonics is also impacting many other technologies. And so there's a very nice contribution from the group at uh, Lincoln Lab and MIT, where um, they've developed multi-wavelength photonic uh, devices that are also uh, 
uh, designed and integrated with RF and DC trap electrodes to trap uh, at, uh, ions directly above the photonic chip. And then you have grading couplers that can then allow the different ions to be individually addressed. And so this is a very nice demonstration of the co-design and co-packaging of uh, photonics with other quantum technologies. Um, and I think what really kind of summarizes uh, um, sort of future directions for integrated quantum photonics is a very nice contribution um, by another group at MIT, Lincoln Lab, on heterogeneous integrated photonics for quantum information science and engineering. And what they really describe in this contribution to the roadmap is um, sort of a, a, a roadmap and a vision towards how to develop photonic technologies um, that have really uh, high functionality and are uh, the complexity to be able to uh, achieve all of these goals that we're trying to, to achieve with integrated quantum photonics. And so they discuss heterogeneous integrated photonic base platforms, electronic and photonic uh, co-integration, bonding and, and deposition of thin films onto photonic platforms, and then sort of pick and place uh, methods. And the goal here is to really integrate different uh, photonic materials and different components onto a single chip. And the reason you may want to do that is if you look at different integrated photonic platforms, such as silicon on insulator, silica, silicon nitride, 3.5 materials, diamond and lithium niobate. And then if you look at the different photonic components and different functionality, including lasers, quantum light sources, passive and active devices and detectors, there's not one single platform that has full functionality for all these different components. And so we really need a heterogeneous integrated photonic approach going forward to be able to um, develop these technologies. And so this, con this is a very nice contribution that sort of kicks off the roadmap article discussing um, these challenges and then future directions. Um, and so uh, I'd like to uh, uh, conclude um, really with a few predictions at least uh, that I have, maybe maybe bold predictions for the next five years or so. So what I think we're gonna see is we're gonna go beyond NISC devices and really see a quantum advantage of technologies that are running useful algorithms. Uh, and this is gonna require foundry level fabrication of heterogeneous quantum photonic integrated circuit platforms. I think we'll also see the, develop, the development of more sophisticated quantum networks of dissimilar quantum systems. For example, a node with an NV center and a different node with a superconducting qubit. And uh, what's needed to do this is to develop uh, quantum memories and repeaters as well as high fidelity transducers that can convert quantum signals uh, between um, uh, these different frequencies that these different uh, nodes operate at. And then I think we'll also see some really exciting photonics enabled scientific discoveries, for example, discoveries um, related to dark matter or fundamental tests of quantum mechanics. And I think this is gonna require uh, the development of entangled arrays of sensors and quantum elements. And this is entanglement that's distributed remotely as well as sort of chip scale local entanglement. Okay, so um, to conclude sort of this introduction um, so we can move on to the uh, more technical talks, um, I'd really uh, just like to thank all of the co-authors that have contributed to the roadmap on integrated quantum photonics. There's an amazing list of co-authors that have all written very nice contributions. Um, and so I encourage you to go and read through the, the roadmap article. And I'd also like to thank IOP and JFIS Photonics as well as um, the sponsors for this webinar. Um, okay, so thank you everyone, and if uh, there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them if we have time. If not, I will um, try to respond in the, in the chat with uh, responses to your questions. Thanks everyone. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Galen, and um, thank you so much for, for all your work, um, along with Volker, um, organizing, organizing the roadmap as well. Um, so I believe uh, Volker is actually going to be chairing the, the webinar today. Um, he had a few technical issues at, at the beginning, so um, so so we just went straight to to an introduction of, of JFIS Photonics. But um, Volker, are you able to hear us now? Yes, loud and clear. Um, thank you very much, uh, Anastasia and Kate. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's a, it's really like a pleasure um, of um, like chairing this session this morning, and um, thank you, thank you, Gal Moody, for this like wonderful introduction already. Uh, my name is Volker Zorder, and um, um, I'm with the George Washington University at this time. Um, wonderful. Um, I think at this point we can just probably directly go to the like like go to the questions as well. Um, maybe starting enough. Thank you, thank you, Gal. Um, I remember the like the slide you showed with the numbers of qubits um, over time. Uh, really, you know, of course, reminding us a bit of this uh, like good old Moore's law style, where we're just starting to put more and more um, basically coupled components into 
into a circuit to get higher functionality. Um, I remember at some point I did see an uh, in talk. It talked about the sort of like an almost like a minimum set of um, of qubits in order to become somewhat functional. And I think remember like like the number was around 100 or maybe a little bit more. Or so uh, maybe could like could you comment a little bit about basically where we are currently in particular in integrated photonics and PICs uh, in this sort of like use like um, usability chart of um, mapping these qubits onto onto applications yeah that's um that's a great question um so i would say that so that plot that i showed sort of the number of qubits versus you know the year that's uh sort of a more uh probably too simplistic of a view it's really not just the number of qubits but it's really also like for example the errors um and so how noisy are your qubits uh and so um, it really kind of depends on sort of whether your qubits need error correction, as well as uh, what is the fidelity of the single and two qubit gates that you can that you can operate with. So um, I would say with integrated photonics using photonic qubits, I think they're a little bit later to this race based on that timeline. Some of the first demonstrations are really just a couple of years ago. Um, and so right now we're sort of at eight qubits compared to, you know, sort of tens to upwards of 100 qubits for other platforms. Um, so the technology isn't quite as mature, but I think the future is actually pretty bright for photonic qubits because depending on how you develop your uh, your sort of hardware and your algorithms, um, you can kind of build in error correction really nicely as you go. And so I think we're going to see some really remarkable advances in the next five years or so with photonic uh, qubits. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Gal. Um, maybe quick follow up on the noise side. Um, indeed, exactly. I remember those plots were on the y-axis. Basically, is the like noise fidelity and the x-axis numbers of qubit, and they they form some sort of like L-shape um, kind of kind of structure, basically, um, with like a knee, like a like a bend. And mm -hmm. um, in terms of noise, do you see a particular um, um, opportunities or threats? Um, using the integratedness of our circuits as opposed to, let's say, ions or free space approaches? I think for any approach, as you start scaling up um, and you're trying to pack in more and more qubits or more and more, more elements onto a chip and then probably networking those chips, I think all approaches are going to see challenges with uh, maintaining low noise and high fidelity operations as you start scaling them up. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's easy, but I think it's easier to make a, like a single qubit work really well. But then trying to scale it up to tens or hundreds or thousands or eventually maybe millions of qubits, that's where the challenge, um, I think, uh, comes into play. And I think a, that's mostly an engineering challenge. We kind of understand the fundamental science of a lot of these different platforms already really well. And so now we're kind of transitioning to more engineering challenges to try to maintain the really good single qubit um, operations and two qubit operations as we scale everything up. Right, and in the end, um, an optical, in this case, quantum processor um, certainly has many signatures and features that also a quote-unquote simple um, optical transceiver link features as well. Basically, SNR signal noise ratio, um, bit error rate um, at the detector, and so on, and then of course they can clean up. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's a very nice uh, comment. Just to, I guess conclude um, that. I think it's one advantage of integrated photonics for quantum computing is that sort of in the same um, sort of infrastructure, you've got the computing architecture and the networking kind of built in. We're likely going to have to network many chips together to make a, a sort of a fault tolerance universal quantum computer. So. Okay, um, great. I think with this, then we can probably um, uh, segue nicely now to um, Professor uh, John Bowers and um, learn more about um, the system approach and the co-integration and, uh, and laser sources as well. Thank you, Galen, one more time. Wonderful. Um, John, you're up. All right. Thank you very much, Volker. Uh, let me start this here. Let's see. I don't know if you can see my screen now. Yes, we can see the and I guess I should switch swap screens. Is that correct? I think. I think it's correct the way it is right now. John shows the presenter one, the the main one. Is this better or worse? This is worse. 
Okay. Yeah, it was fine as it was, John. If you don't mind um, swapping the display again. All right, great. Well, thank you for that introduction. And uh, as we discussed in the previous slide, I'd like to talk about or technically how we implement this and, and where the state of integration is and, and, and what's possible. Uh, I want to acknowledge Galen and others at UCSB, Lin Chang and Trevor, Josh and Corey for, for fabricating these devices. And here's one example uh, shown here. This is an array of lasers, a variety of different lasers, DFB, DBR and so forth, pumping in arrays of, of resonators for photon entanglement. And uh, so I'd like to go into all of that, that technology. So as Galen just introduced uh, very eloquently, um, there's a lot of platforms for quantum technology. We'll focus today on photonic platforms and ways to get photon, in particular photon entanglement. We're focused on using spontaneous four-way mixing. So we have resonators and uh, again, typically pulley couplers and we take two pump photons and, and generate on resonance and generate uh, signal and idler photons. And this <clears throat> generation rate is very dependent on the on the nonlinearity, and so we'll focus on highly nonlinear materials. And it's very dependent upon the Q of the cavity. So again, we'll work. I'll describe how to get very high Q cavities. And again, it goes like Q to the cube. So it's it's, it's very important. Um, so it's important that we use highly nonlinear materials and materials where we can get very high Q uh, resonators. So I'll talk about two in particular today. One is silicon nitride, where we can get Qs of you know several hundred million, uh, and then aluminum gallium arsenide on insulator. And the big advantage of this platform is that the nonlinearity is about uh, a thousand times larger than silicon dioxide and a hundred times bigger than silicon nitride. And so uh, it has other advantages as shown here, besides being highly nonlinear, it's a high refractive index. And when we put it on silicon, in particular clad with silicon dioxide, we get very tight coupling and uh, very small modes and, and so very large nonlinearities. And as I showed the first slide, and I'll, I'll describe again later, we can also make uh, laser integration with this. And again, the advantage of, of aluminum gallium arsenide over silicon is that the, uh, by putting enough aluminum there, we can avoid two photon absorption. Uh, and that's, that's pretty key. So here's an example. So here's a, the fundamental TE mode. Again, it's clad on all sides with silicon dioxide. So a typical dimension is you know, 400 nanometers high, easily grown with, with MBE or MOCVD, and widths of around 700 nanometers. And again, here's a resonator, and you can, you can see here, this is a straight coupler. We use uh, pulley couplers to get higher cues, but uh, that's the general technology I wanna talk about. To get the very high cues that you need here, uh, there's a bunch of things that one needs to do. One is we typically do reflow of resist to get away from this roughness and the resist edge, so you get a much smoother edge. And on the sidewall here, you can see it, that this roughness limits your Q to typically below a million. And with very smooth sidewalls, uh, you can get you know, Qs of, of 3 million or more as shown here. And Waquan developed this uh, technology at UCSB and there's a nice paper here in Optics Express that, that describes that. And again, of course, the roughness on the top and the bottom, the L gas is very important and it is, Typically required to use MBE material because the lower carbon uh, incorporation results in lower absorption losses. So as one example, we can look at just Kirk home generation uh, in one of these uh, resonators. And uh, we can see with very low power, it's just 23 microwatts of power, we can generate uh, Kerr lines, comb lines. And again, that's due to the very large N2 and the very small area of these structures. So it's, you know, a lot lower than the typical sort of milliwatt levels that one needs with other technologies. So we can use that then for on-chip photon pair generation. And uh, Trevor Steiner wrote a very nice paper, PRX, describing these results. So again, this is discrete now, where these are not yet integrated, although I'll show you some examples in a second. Uh, but again, pulley coupler devices and uh, looking at on-chip generation rates of you know 10 to the seventh pairs per second. And uh, Again, the big advantage of this technology is shown here. So here's you know, a lot of different platforms that one could use. And again, at the very high end of CHI-3 is aluminum gallium arsenide. And again, with the higher cues that you're getting, we're able to get very high entangled photon generation rates, perhaps 200 times higher than the silicon nitride. So you can get higher cues in silicon nitride, 
but really benefiting from the very, very high nonlinearity. So I think it's a very promising technology. Now the question is, how can we make more complex circuits? And uh, so we need to integrate the laser along with this. And there's two approaches that are viable. One is heterogeneous integration, where three, five materials are bonded. So in addition to bonding the, the aluminum gallium arsenide for the resonator, one can bond gain regions, either quantum well or quantum dot. And then you etch off the substrate and, and fabricate them uh, all, all together. And here's an example. Intel has commercialized this process. And so here's a 300 millimeter wafer fabricated in a conventional CMOS line. And in this case, these are 100 gigabit optical transceivers, but uh, this very technology could be used for optical computing. And uh, again, they're in high volume production, uh, making millions of transceivers a year using this technology. Another approach is to monolithically uh, integrate. And so epitaxially grow 3-5 materials on silicon. And, uh, and it turns out using quantum dots is really essential. So obviously there's a lot of quantum applications uh, of quantum dot technology for single photon generation. But here we're using the fact that the uh, dots are very uh, insensitive to defects and the lifetimes are very good. So here's an example of work with IQE in particular. And here they're growing 3-5 materials on 300 millimeter substrates. And as part of the DARPA LUMOS program, uh, they're growing uh, these structures, uh, including full quantum dot structures, and we're making lasers out of them. There's been a real recent breakthrough, I would call it here, of using blocking layers to prevent misfits from entering the active regions. And uh, as a result, we're getting million hour, 100 million hour lifetime at room temperature and 200,000 lifetimes at 80 degrees C. So it's, it's very exciting. Here's an example now of integrating the two together, and this is the photo I showed in the cover slide. But again, we have a variety of lasers, either DBR or DFB or Tunable or Fabry Pro, pumping resonators. And typically, the, you need a phase modulator between the two. So we've integrated these three devices together. And that's because these resonators can stabilize these lasers and reduce the noise out of them by as much as 70 dB. And I'll show that in a second. Um, but the backscatter from these resonators is what we're using to stabilize the laser and reduce the noise. So the modulator here is very important. So we've got a bunch of different lasers and a bunch of different resonator structures. And you can see that here on wafer scale. If you blow it up, you can see these different sort of laser structures. So these lasers are pumping the resonators here. These lasers are pumping the resonators on this side. A little more blow up here. Um, and uh, again, you can see the, the resonators here. So this is a collaboration with uh, Tobias Kippenberg uh, at uh, EPFL. And with those, we generated soliton generation. And so depending upon uh, how much current you put in, how much power you put in, you get single soliton generation or two, three, or four uh, solitons in the resonator, soliton crystals. And so obviously the rep rate changes by that factor of two, three, or four. Um, in other work, we've looked at integrating um, silicon nitride uh, hybrids. So these two chips are side by side. And uh, so again, you have DFB lasers, high Q resonators, and you can get you know reduction in noise of, in this case, modestly, you know, 30 dB noise reduction. Um, and what we discovered is that you get this turnkey soliton generation, where uh, the backscattered light uh, puts you into the single soliton mode, and and it's, it's turnkey. You don't need to adjust the frequency of the power. You just turn the laser on and uh, it automatically goes into this single soliton uh, mode. And you can do this at a terahertz or 40 gigahertz or 20 gigahertz. And the whole package is actually quite small. And these are now dark solitons, not bright solitons. So we're operating in a normal dispersion regime, which makes it a lot simpler to use in terms of, of thinner nitrides. And uh, we're able to now generate Kirkholms and the noise on all of these lines is you know, on the order of below 10 hertz. So again, it's a very simple structure, just a DFB laser coupled to a, a high key resonator. And then if you put a flood detector at the output, you get a very, very quiet microwave signal uh, with, you know, down to minus 140 dBc per hertz. So we can go further. Those results are limited by the thermal refractive noise in that cavity. And we can make longer cavities. And in this case, this is a three millimeter wafer uh, a commercial process. You can see here across that wafer, we can routinely get cues of you know over 200 million up to 260 million. And uh, when we couple those to lasers, 
we get because now the volume is bigger, the free spectral range is lower, uh, we get even more noise reduction. So uh, we get up to 70 dB noise reduction. So again, this is still thermal refractive noise limited at this point, but you can take this laser that has a megahertz line width and get something that has a Lorentzian line width of just 40 millihertz. And so that's illustrated here. This is the progression in line width of lasers over the years, last 30 years. And indeed, indiphosphide laser lines have gotten better particularly with quantum dots where the line with enhancement factor is very close to zero and uh, we can get uh, you know qu quite quite narrow line lists. When you hybrid integrate with or heterogeneously integrate with these silicon nitride or silicon dioxide resonators you get very short line lists and as shown here down to just 40 millihertz uh, line width and I think we'll continue to see that and we're, we're still on a very linear curve with thermal refractive noise. So we can take these technologies now, and make you know more complex quantum applications. And so here's some examples for quantum gates or boson sampling or teleportation. And these are you know quite complex circuits, and and uh, you know one wonders when this would actually happen. But I think we're on the cusp of this. This is no more complex than than telecommunication devices we're making today. So again, as illustrated here, you might have you know electronics you know bonded to this and, and getting two dimensional uh, connection from electronics to photonics to control them. And we're doing that today. So we, we routinely have these 36 micron pitch electronics bonded and driving the photonics directly. And again, as I've just shown, one can integrate lasers with that. And uh, uh, so, you know, this level of integration and the levels that, that Galen talked about of getting, you know, hundreds of qubits are not so far fetched. If you look at the level of photonic integration, he showed one for quantum photonics. This is sort of everything. The number of devices that are integrated on a single waveguide. And any phosphide has increased rapidly. Uh, silicon started much later, of course, because it's not, you know, uh, does not have gain and, and uh, does not have a box effect and, and so forth. But once it started, it's exploded. And now the largest picks are all made with silicon photonics in, in a CMOS uh, environment. And so this is uh, uh, silicon photonics heterogeneously integrated, hybrid integrated and then heterogeneously integrated with the lasers on the same chip is lagging by a couple of years, but again, progressing very rapidly. And what you see here is the key to why this is all possible, which is that there's all these electronics companies that are making silicon photonic transceivers in particular. So the most advanced switching chips or processor chips or memory chips will all use optics to get the, the data on and off these very big electronic chips. So the next, a Broadcom chip, for example, uh, 50 terabit per second, they're talking about having co-packaged optics and eventually moving towards in integrated optics. So to summarize for quantum picks, I, I showed some results for aluminum beyond marcenide resonators with a, a large improvement in photon pair brightness, very high generation rates, good visibility, good single photon purity. Um, and then I talked about integration of resonators with, with uh, lasers and so algas as well as silicon nitride uh, and in case, particularly with silicon nitride you can make very quiet lasers very very small line lists and uh, so that's really really exciting and again thousands of photonic components being integrated today and that will soon be over a hundred thousand at, at the rate we're moving so I think the future is as Galen indicated you know very complex highly functional highly integrated very efficient quantum picks with, with hundreds of qubits. So with that, I'd be glad to take questions. Thank you. Well, wonderful, uh, John. Really exciting uh, directions here on aluminum gun arsenide um, on insulator structures, uh, lasers, low noise. Um, uh, very, very exciting. Um, um, let me just see it with one maybe question and we have also some here from the, from the audience. Um, uh, John, you were talking about the importance of a phase shifter between the laser sources and the ring modulators in order to stabilize it. Do you have an um, uh, auto magnitude uh, number that if one would not do that, what the noise um, of the laser is as opposed to with that uh, nice addition of the phase shifter? Okay, thanks. In the Nature Photonics paper that was listed there, there's a nice theory that uh, we've developed. and Dependent upon the phase of the backscatter light, you may not get into the single soliton regime, but rather you get into this mm -hmm. modulation and stability regime. 
So there is a, a range of phases that work, uh, but it's uh, if you don't have the correct phase between the backscatter and the laser coming out, then it, you're not in this quiet mode of operation. So uh, it, it is one way to do it is what we did, which is to integrate a modulator on there so we can just adjust that. And then our yield of devices is literally pretty much 100%. If we just package two chips next to each other, then the, the gap between them matters. And then when we do an active alignment, we can get pretty much 100% yield. But you have to do an active alignment. The spacing between the two chips matters. I think a better way is either to integrate it on a single chip or to have a, just to, to mount them close together with maximum coupling and have a, a phase modulator there to adjust it. Makes sense, right, nice. Um, maybe just one, one, one quick other follow up on the, on the laser and the noise side. Um, so does the essentially noise uh, improvement on laser, is it, is it primarily line width? And you mentioned also, of course, a nice like, like Laurentian line width, or is it, does it also help in the like laser side lobe um, suppression um, or, or actually both? Uh, it's both. So, you know, we see these are highly single mode, typically, you know, 70 dB side mode suppression. And we do see RIN reduction, you know, down below minus 140 dBc per hertz. Uh, but as you can see in this slide here, we see this, you know, across a very wide range of frequencies, this large reduction in, uh, in, fre in frequency noise or, or phase noise. This is plot of frequency noise. So, um, you know, low, very low frequencies, you start to see an increase here. Uh, this is at a kilohertz, you know, down below hertz, you start to see environmental effects coming in. Uh, but you know, indeed, you know, we're, we're in the end, this this is limited by the thermal refractive noise. And so Kerry Valhalla's group has done a very nice theory of that. And uh, uh, we've been using that. And, and so, again, you know, this is 135 megahertz uh, free structure range. It's about one meter long cavity. If you go to 10 meter long cavities, we expect to see, again, a dramatic reduction below this level. And so that's really, really very mm. exciting. Indeed, right. Uh, in fact, we do have a question, like another question also from uh, um, from a webinar attendee. And um, it's a bit more of an open question. It essentially relates to um, the differences specifically between integrated quantum photonics and integrated nanophotonics. And the, like, like the, the notion is um, that at the nanoscale, objects follow also quantum mechanics. And um, uh, the question is a little bit around um, clarifying the differences between maybe at the higher level between integrated quantum photonics as we discussed it mainly I guess today and maybe notions of nano nano optical structures which also preserve certain quantumness in their in their by by, by sheer size probably like like to see quantum effects. Could you maybe comment about any about this? Sure I mean I think the two fields are very much converging and one of the really exciting parts about going to these CMOS foundries with you know incredible lithography right you know they can they can make these nanophotonic structures easily. Just you know, you write it on the mask, and and they, they come out. So much better lithographic capabilities than most of us have been using in, in photonics. Right. And so uh, I think we will indeed see you know much smaller lasers. Uh, there's really nice work out of uh, Matsuo's group at, at NTT on making the you know these photonic crystal lasers where the thresholds are you know just microamps and. Uh, uh, and they're very, very small. So, you know, when we fabricate with Intel, for example, you know, they can write large arrays of gratings across the way from, you know, chirp gratings and, and different sorts of phase shifts in here and everything. And it's it's really simple to do lots of very interesting, you know, investigations that would be very difficult for us to do otherwise. And I think in general, we'll see this nanophotonic integration. So, you know, photonic crystal lasers for sure. Um, in the case of something like what I've shown here, High power is important, and and uh, so there, there, there's a trade-off there in terms of getting, you know, the, the one over power dependence of line with typically. Um, so uh, those may end up being bigger structures, but I think we're going to see a lot of synergy in cross fertilization between these two fields. Indeed, wonderful, right? Because certainly, right, the integration capability and the lithographic um, definitions that um, industry offers on the, on sort of like the chip side and then also like emerging technologies and approaches on the sort of like nano optic side offer if these two like also like converge, um, converge as you're uh, basically sharing with us, 
um, that's certainly like a very exciting direction now, exactly indeed. And then there's the ability to scale up quickly, right? The, the, you know, when you take this, I mean, everything I've talked about today could be done today in, in multiple foundries. Uh, you know, obviously Intel, but also, you know, there's two DARPA programs, Lumos at, at Tower Semiconductor and at AIM Photonics. And mm. the lasers are integrated with, with the rest of it. And again, the advantage of CMOS is you can scale very quickly. So Intel went from you know, nothing to, to several million transceivers a year in just two years, right? And, and yeah. they could scale to 100 million transceivers a year. So that's, you know, when we start looking at quantum computing being widely deployed, that's really very possible, I think. Very exciting. Um, I think uh, we're, as you're basically just quoting yourself, uh, just at the, at the cusp of, um, of a very, very nice directions and very like like very exciting technology that have basically been developed and um, um, and moving forward. Um, thank you, John. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Bowers. Um, he is a distinguished professor at UCSB and holds the um, Fred Kavli Chair in Nanotechnology and is also director of an Institute of Energy Efficient, like Energy Efficiency, which again efficiency in energy is also something certainly that um, quantum systems will be um, will be playing a major role as well. Thank you very much. Moving on, um, we are um, moving to um, Professor Val Ziller. He is um, with the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. And um, we'll hear about um, more quantum photonic integrated structures uh, next. And yes, we can see the slide. Thanks, good to be here. Um, Indeed, so I'll be telling you about what we're doing in terms of, uh, and, and has to be done in, in, in the whole community, right, in terms of uh, waveguide integrated uh, detectors and also a little bit of single photon and I think photon generation all into, into waveguide. So this is work done at, at, at KTH here in Stockholm. Um, and we also have to acknowledge uh, the collaborations with single quantum in, back in, in, in the Netherlands. Um, so I'd like to tell you about uh, the components that we are we, that we need to be able to really implement the type of, of, of picture I'm, I'm showing here, where I would like to have is uh, single photon sources, if not entangled photon sources, uh, all into into optical waveguides, and be able to manipulate that that light into the waveguides and then uh, detect these single photons. Right? So. And the first, the first thing I'd like to talk about is the detection. How are we able to detect a single photon with high efficiency, high time resolution, and so on? And the, the answer came, came from the call that 20 years ago exactly. Uh, in 2001, the Professor Goldsman in Moscow came up with this, this concept of using a superconducting nanowire to detect single photons. So the concept is shown here, where what you see is that uh, if you have a superconducting nanowire, so the thickness is going to be on the order of 5 to 10 nanometers typically. The width is going to be on the order of 100 nanometers, and this is called below TC. And um, the absorption of a single photon is enough to destroy the superconducting state that, that we have here. So we just drive a constant current below the critical current, and what happens is B and C, we create this resistive uh, region into the nanowire, forcing the supercurrent to flow around it. We exceed the critical density, and we have a detection event. The system just goes resistive. So in terms of, of, of operation, this is very trivial, essentially, right? What we need to do is apply a constant current and a single photon absorbing our device will give us a voltage spike. All right. What's also interesting is that 20 years on, we're still debating the exact physical mechanism of this process. Right? What I show here is, of course, very basic and a, a complete full understanding still remains to, 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 be, to be obtained. All right. <clears throat> This is a typical detection pulse. So what you see is that we have an extremely fast rise time. Okay? And then the recovery is essentially set by the kinetic inductance of the device, okay? which typically for a large device, as I'll, I'll be showing in, in the coming slides, is on the order of many nanoseconds. That typical device here I'm showing is a, a, a total of about eight nanoseconds to re recovery. And here is a typical device. So what we very often want to have is a efficient single photon detection um, on uh, whatever comes out of an optical fiber, single mode optical fiber typically. Hence, what we like to do usually is to make a detector with a diameter of the order of 10 microns, okay? and we make our nanowire meander 
over that, that region, which means the overall length of our nanowire is on the order of 500 micrograms. Okay. And this, this means that the kinetic inductance is, is non-negligible and we have these 10 to 20 or so nanoseconds of recovery time for every event. But as we make the nanowire shorter, and I'll come back to this later, of course, we can operate much faster. The recovery time is going to be a lot, a lot faster. What else do we have? Well, the, 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 the different techniques are available to, to prepare the films. So sputtering is a very uh, usual uh, technique, but there's also MBE, ALD, CVD. So there's a lot of uh, different techniques available, which have been recently shown to be very good, to also uh, give us very high quality film, superconducting film that we can then use to make our detectors. The, the operation temperature is typically on the order of 2.5 Kelvin. For some materials, it may have to be even a bit lower. Okay, So that means that we, of course, obviously need to cool down our devices now to, to cryogenic temperatures. And in many cases, only for the detectors. We have cases that I'll be showing you now that the emission of single photons, everything else, is working very well at room temperature, but the detectors are the elements, uh, are the instruments that require cooling to cryogenic temperatures. And this is totally uh, justified. So here is the, the specs for a typical commercial device. Uh, what, what you can see as you increase the current you apply on device, shown first here in red, is the detection efficiency. So as you reach about 50 microamps, the detection efficiency starts to, to go up, and it plateaus at something above 90%. Okay, this is system detection efficiency. This is, at, uh, I think, 1.3 microns. Uh, and this is, this is what you get. But when you see, there is a price to pay shown in, the, in black here. Uh, these are the dark counts. So when you operate at fairly high currents to be sure that you have the highest possible detection efficiency, the dark counts may not be negligible anymore, right? So some of the measurements that I'll be showing later were obtained with a very low uh, current. So a sacrifice on the detection efficiency, which can make down to about 60%, but then corresponds then to a dark count in the millihertz range. Of course, a, a, a question for the whole community is, where is the detection efficiency limit? Is it 99%, 99.9? So that's an open question. Um, and the hardest, uh, the hardest thing to answer that question is actually the measurement. Measuring detection efficiency with very small error bars of way lower than one person is extremely challenging. Even our friends at NIST, I think, will confirm this. It is very time consuming, very hard, to come up with very precise detection efficiency. So it, it is, in a sense, harder to measure the high efficiency than to actually obtain it by nanofabrication of the devices. So this is to, to show you also the detection efficiency as a function of wavelength for one particular type of device where we have a resin cavity, okay, and the light is brought with an optical fiber, okay. And you can see we can make an optical device, a resonator, uh, sent 1.3 microns, for instance, and then we get this high efficiency there. And in the neighborhood, we still get a, a very decent, uh, decent uh, detection efficiency. Okay. An open question in this field is, where is the detection limit for energy to the blue and to the red? So single photons cannot be detected with this, this technique here uh, down to the medium infrared okay, at a cost, of course, of efficiency. But we can detect single photons down to 10 microns. And the same goes for the blue. We can detect very deep in the blue. We have a paper recently out, for instance, for X-ray single photon detection. Okay, so that that these are other um, regions where these type of detectors could really make quantum optics possible in the deep UV with X-rays, or in the mid infrared, where also single photon detectors with this type of time resolution and detection efficiency were never available so so far. So I'm talking about time resolution, and here are some of the results. So what I show on the left is one of the first devices we, 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 we ever made some, 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 let's say, 10 years ago. And at the time, you can see that we had a time resolution here of on the order of 80 picoseconds. Okay? And what we did over the years, we improved the electronics. So we switched to cryogenic amplifiers. We worked with impedance matching and, and, and so on. So we really optimized all everything there. And what we are able to achieve nowadays is a somewhat easily something of the order of 10 picoseconds of, of time jitter, right? which, which is starting to be very significant for many applications. Because, uh, for instance, in LIDAR, uh, 10 picoseconds is the time it takes a light to travel about three millimeters. Right? And this we can do now with a, 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 the single photon detection uh, level. Uh, where is the limit here? This is really unknown. Okay. Uh, so the goal we, we set ourselves is to go below shorter than one picosecond. Okay. Let's see if we'll get there. 
but there is clearly no uh, clear demonstration of any limit there of any uh, lower limit besides delta e delta t and so on uh, so what I want to show you here is that it is perfectly possible to combine a uh, high detection efficiency together with high time resolution and this with this type of detectors and this over essentially a very large uh, frequency range. What I show you on the left is uh, at low energies, mid infrared. So these measurements are done at three microns of wavelength. So we're detecting here single photons uh, at three microns. Okay. And you can see that we are able to detect single photons uh, rather efficiently. Okay, uh, this is a normalized efficiency here. We can reach one one hundred percent by far, but still we are able to detect single photons at three microns. And at the time, the corresponding time resolution is still about fourteen picoseconds. So we can detect in the mid infrared single photons and still have a very high time resolution. At telecom uh, frequencies, what we can do is achieve efficiencies on uh, way above ninety percent. Okay, and this again together with a time resolution of the order of fifteen picoseconds. Okay. And in the visible, for, its, for green light, for instance, uh, where they're also able to achieve very high efficiencies, in this case, on the order of 80%, uh, together again with a very high time resolution. So we can really combine, there's no trade off here with this type of detectors. We can combine high detection efficiency together with, uh, with the very uh, high performances in all other aspects. Another issue that uh, was a, a limiting factor in the early days was a polarization sensitivity. One polarization was uh, was detected with a higher efficiency than the other. Okay? You can see this in the inset at the bottom left here, where we plot the polar detection efficiency for TM over TE. And you can see that we had a high ratio with a dashed line here, which is just a bare detector, okay? a meandering uh, nanowire on, 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 on the silicon substrate. Yeah? What we were able to do with simulation and, and then doing it in, in, in the lab was to, in, to deposit a bit of silicon nitride on top of our detectors. And this has this very nice effect that it uh, essentially uh, gets this polarization dependence uh, away. So we were now able to get, as you can see, something like 0 0.9. So a, a ratio for both polarities starts to be close to UVT. It also shows that we can deposit silicon nitride on our detectors, and this means we can also obviously also make waveguides yeah, uh, onto our detectors, which is, of course, what I want to get to. Of course, another question is how many detectors can you operate? Right? Because for many of the applications we've already heard about, uh, we will need a massive amount of detectors. I've been showing you so far a single detector, uh, but we need to already think about scaling up. So the very simple system I've been I've been showing before, uh, based on the smallest crowd cooling systems we, we we can we can get we can have available today, uh, are able to operate as many as 48 of these detectors, okay, with one cooling system and still reach a temperature of the order of 2.5 Kelvin. Okay, of course here the limit is uh, the coaxial cables. I mean we have a coaxial line, one coaxial cable for every detector that takes us to room temperature. That's the heat load, right? It is definitely not the detectors. So there will be, of course, a need in the future to also be able to, to operate with a lower heat load by maybe processing, analyzing all of the detection events within the cryos and only coming out with, with the results. Nevertheless, we're scaling this up as much as we can, and we have the system under development here at KTH that is designed now to operate about a thousand detectors uh, simultaneously. And once we reach these kind of numbers, uh, what we're going to suffer from is an avalanche of photo detection data. Right? Um, if we are time tagging every single photon detection event, okay, and these for a thousand detectors, and these at a rep rate or detection rate that can be on the order of 80 megahertz, the amount of data we have to process is becoming uh, just a major issue for us. This is something that is becoming very hard to handle. So there's a problem there also, just on the computer side, how do we handle so much data when we're really able to operate hundreds of detectors at very high detection rates. So making these detectors uh, and coupling them to, to WebGuide, this is what I show here. So what we do is we again make the very same type of detectors. This is a niobium titanium nitride. You see here on the SM image on the right, a niobium titanium nitride film, which we etch by even lithography. And this time we don't meander very much anymore. We have one single hairpin. We go out and back in. Okay. We add some wires here for inductance. We have enough inductance to have a beautiful detection pulse. Okay. And this is our detector. The nice thing here is that this is very small, okay. uh, meaning we will have very low kinetic inductance, hence a very short recovery time. Okay, um, 
And this, of course, once we have this on, on, on couple of wave guides, we were able to, to implement uh, feedback. Right? We can use the detection event on one part of the chip to go and drive something else on the very same chip. Okay. And of course, to implement and operate a very large number of detectors all on, 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 on a single a very small uh, chip we can now hear uh, beyond a thousand detectors on, on the chip. And as you can see in the detection events uh, here, I mean, for a curve here, uh, we are never also, of course, here able also to reach very high detection efficiencies. Um, this is in fact made easier because uh, the coupling to, to, the, to, to the field in these in these webcasts is, is, is very efficient, is very good. So absorption here is, is really not, not, not much of a problem anymore. So there we have a, a way to detect single photons in a waveguide with a very high efficiency and very high time resolution. So how do we implement this? What I've shown you is, is, is that particular, on the left here, that particular implementation where we have a single uh, superconducting nanowire single photon detector, uh, one single meander, one single uh, hairpin uh, approach, okay? Which we could, of course, also uh, double up in that sense that uh, we, we show here at the, at the bottom, okay? This means very low complexity. Okay? This is a very easy fabrication and, and even operation uh, process. Okay, uh, but there's, there's, there are some some trade-offs. I want to ask. There's a, some some little trade-offs here. Okay, what we can also do is is have multiple SNSPDs all coupled to the same waveguide. Okay, and this has one advantage, one major advantage. This gives access to pseudo photon number resolution PNR. Right. Very often in many of the applications that we've already heard about, we will need to be able also to measure photon number. Okay? And that's something you can start to do when you have a good number of detectors, because if you send you now two photons onto such a device here, and you've got three detectors, for instance, in that particular cartoon here, well, you can hope that in some cases, uh, the two photons will hit different detectors and give us two clicks, right? And as you scale up the number of detectors, right? you are more and more likely to be able to really resolve the fidelity of your photon number resolution increases with the number of detectors. So that's, a, of course, pseudo. We're not there at, at, at a perfect photon number resolution, but we have this. What we can also do is use a cavity enhanced uh, scheme where we really increase the, the, the optical field very much, and then we were able to operate with an extremely small superconducting nanowire, very small, and this means very low kinetic inductance. This means very fast um, uh, rapturing. We can re we recover and we're ready to detect again very quickly. Uh, so there, there are some advantages. And again, some, some of the trade-offs are, are there again. Um, so here is a device where what we did was to combine single photon sources, which in this case is quantum dots, um, colloidal quantum dots. Uh, you see in the bottom left right, where they are here, and they are embedded in the silicon nitride waveguide. So we simply, with an optical pulse, excite these quantum dots, and they will generate a stream of, of, of single photons. Okay. These single photons propagate along the nanowires okay, that way, and they are then uh, coming out here onto this uh, micro grating. So what we have here in, this, in, the, in the black rectangle here is essentially a spectrometer. Okay. And the emission from the quantum dot then is dispersed and is sent back to several uh, different waveguides, depending on the things which you can see at, at, at the right uh, figure here. So the light comes out there on the left, along the left waveguide here, all right, covers our dispersing grating, and then different uh, frequencies, different colors will end up on different waveguides there. And behind each waveguide, or coupled to each waveguide, we have one of these superconducting nanowire single photon as I've shown you before. And this mean, means that we have detection from the red to, 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 to green channel. It helps us to do on chip single photon spectroscopy. Uh, it's, it was reported now some, some time ago. Now, one thing that counts very, very much in all these, all these events, all these processes is, is the time resolution of our detectors. Right? We need a very high time resolution because what we're showing here is simply a very simple simulation of the correlation, okay, so the single photon measurement, okay, on an ideal single photon source, which would have a lifetime of 100 picoseconds, but where on the top side here, on the top, we would have a 200 picoseconds of timing duty in the detector. So we have a perfect ideal single photon source, okay, but our detector has a timing jitter of 200 picoseconds, which can easily get from an avalanche photodiode. 
what you see is the dip here that is supposed to go down to zero for the ideal case only goes down to about 0 0.55 or so. Right? So we don't even reach 0 0.5. And this is only because the dip is washed out by the low timing jitter of that detector. If you instead do the exact same simulation, but now have 10 picoseconds of timing jitter, something we achieve these days easily with our detectors, what you can see is that you recover an extremely good uh, anti-bunching uh, behavior, right? So the G2 noise to that 0 0.04. So this is just to say that time resolution is a very essential uh, feature in many quantum measurements where, and it's something you cannot, you cannot uh, gain back or, or compensate by longer measurements. Okay? Of course, the time resolution also sets the bandwidth in all kinds of communication, be them quantum or not uh, applications. What I want to briefly show you also is the type of single photon sources we are making and how we implement them into our waveguides. So this is a type of quantum dot self-assembly in this particular case here that are engineered to emit at a telecom wavelength. So what we have here is a strain tunable quantum dot uh, based on Gallimard cinema materials that emit uh, single photons, even entangled photons at a wavelength of 1.55 microns uh, above. And you can see that by playing with the, the, the piezo here, by applying a voltage, large voltage on, on, on the piezo, we're able to strain our quantum dots and modify the emission frequency uh, substantially. And this we can do for the exciton, trion, and, 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 and bison in this, in this particular case. So this now gives us a source of single photons, entangled photons at telecom wavelength, tunable, uh, and working extremely well at low temperatures. And when we look at these type of devices, and do again this anti bunching measurement looking for the single photon nature of the emitter under pulse excitation in this case here. Um, and these are dots emitting at 795 nanometers. What we achieve is an extra, extremely good um, uh, G2 measurement. You can see that there's really obviously no uh, correlation events at time zero. If we zoom in here, we see there's 21 events, okay? And this gives us an, a very, 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 very uh, good, uh, uh, very highly pure uh, single photon statistics. This is made possible not only again by the quantum bus themselves, which are of course very clean, but also by the detectors, which we, in this case, we operate at a fairly low current of 60% of the, of, the, of the bias of the clear current, which means that we get extremely low dark count rates for our detectors in the millihertz range. Okay? And this is what, what enables this extremely pure uh, observation of, of, of single photon behavior. We can also do this with nanowires. This is what I'd like to tell you in the, the last part of my presentation. We can also use nanowires quantum dots. So these are grown in Canada by our friends in, in at, uh, NRC Ottawa. So what they can do, they can sandwich a little segment of indium arsenide phosphide in an indium phosphide nanowire. Okay? And this little segment is going to act as a quantum dot. Okay? And when they choose things right, they get as quantum dots emitting at around 1.3 microns of the telecom wavelength with very sharp lines and, and so on. And these are diff every color is a different quantum dot. Okay? And every line is a different uh, different uh, species. It could be an exciton, a bi-exciton, a charge exciton, double charge exciton, and so on. So we have these beautiful sharp lines. And now what we can do is use these nanowires and use those as the single photon sources we're going to implement into our waveguides. Okay. So what we do essentially is we have this array of nanowires. We look at them and identify the good ones and pick the best ones place them on an oxidized silicon wafer and build the whole photonic circuit uh, on, on that. Okay. This is scalable. So here's uh, a, a video of, of the approach. We come with a tip, tungsten tip, and we pick, we're really able to pick a selected nanowire and go lay it flat onto an oxidized silicon wafer. And when it lies flat, this is shown in red here, here's our, our nanowire, our single photon source. We have it lying down on an oxidized silicon wafer, we deposit silicon nitride again, we etch that to define the waveguide containing the, the nanowire, and, and we're good to go, right? So this is what the device looks like, the schematic first, the nanowire spitting out little red single photons, okay, into its silicon nitride waveguide. Okay? And you can see the real device there at the bottom left here, you can make out the, the nanowire in greenish here, and the waveguide is pinkish here. And what we're able to do again is show some time punching measurements. We can show that the spectrum is still very good after the whole process of transfer and uh, silicon nitride deposition and so on. So we have a very clean way to do that. What we can then do also is add um, filtering to that, to that system. So we have our waveguide coupled to the nanowire, single photon source there, right there, bringing our stream of single photons. And now what we add here is a ring resonator. Okay? 
which we can thermally tune in this particular case. I mean, thermally tune it, use the register here, we used to, to tune it, and what you can see is that it really adds, uh, acts as a true drop part, and just by playing with, with, the, with the bias we apply on, on, on our heater here, we, we, can, we can choose, uh, we can tune essentially our, our, our route, I would say, the, the single photons. And it's what we show here, we show routing here. Uh, for instance, we could look here as a function of the voltage we apply on our ring resonator, we can see the excellent emission, right, X here. And we can see that as we increase the voltage, well, the excellent emission is always coming through the through part here. And at some point, it's gone, it's dark. Okay. And then we can look at the other part. It's not in the through part anymore. We look at the drop part, and yes, there it is. So then when the light doesn't come out in the through part, the strip of single photon from the convert right, doesn't come out in the through part anymore, well, we can see it in the drop part. This is what you can see, uh, what you can see here, right? And after some time, we keep on tuning. It's gone here again. It doesn't start there again. And guess what? It's back in the through part. Okay. And this we can do with different lines, okay, from a different quantum, from the same quantum dot and from different quantum dots. Now, this gives us a way really to, 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 to select and to route different single photon emission processes from even the same system into the different, different waveguides. Of course, warming up the system has some drawbacks, right? We want to operate super convenient decoders in the, in, the, in, the, in the neighborhood. That's one thing. And uh, also, for that reason, strain tuning is a better way. I'll come back to this very soon. So that, that, that's one proof of principle, but strain tuning might be better. Another thing is the scalability. If, we, if we're aiming for all the fascinating things we've been hearing about so far, we would need way, way more than one quantum source coupled to a waveguide. So here we have a schematic where we have two of those. Okay. So we've got two quantum dots in nanowires coupled to one waveguide. And what we're able to do with that device here is um, again, use our, our ring resonator to filter out and route, and we can choose at a given voltage here that the emission line, the single photon from quantum dot number two, will be coming out in that part. Or another bias here will be able to send out the photon from another from a, another quantum dot in, into that part. So here we're able not to, to, to really analyze and, and, and play with the emission from several quantum dots. Okay, uh, we can scale this up further. What we can also do is do this, for instance, in the case with six uh, quantum dot nano wires. There they are shown schematically here, each with their own different spectra. And what you see in the inset here is the whole device, where what we have is a set of ring resonators and the photons are sent out, and then we can route any of them into any other, other waveguide. So that's that's what we can do so far. Um, Hal, and then Hal, we just, Hal, um, thank you. Um, we just need to keep it a little bit like, like, an, uh, like an eye on the clock, um, just yeah. FYI. Yeah, so I just have two slides and I'm done. So this is one of my last slides where I show you that we don't rely here anymore on, on the thermal thermal tuning, but this is MEMS, okay? You see, we've got two waveguides and we're able to bend one compared to the other to modify the coupling. So we've got this, this, this uh, beam splitter here, if you want, right? And we were able to, to change the coupling. And this enables us then to, to, to send, as you can see, detection to either, I mean, the light either to detector A or detector B. So we have got this thing and this is the result we have from this device. So all on the chip, again, including detection. And what you can see, we can measure lifetime of a quantum dot, for instance, and we can measure anti-bunching to so single photon generation. Yeah. So the challenges ahead, right? What, what, what did I tell you? Uh, what? First, that superconducting single photon detectors are really approaching the physical limit for efficiency, time resolution, and dark counts. And one of the challenges, surprisingly, is maybe not so much in the fabrication, but it is actually in the efficiency measurements themselves to show, to measure how good the devices are. Waveguide integration also is really impressive. We can go to very large numbers of detectors. Uh, and one challenge there is actually not making a thousand detectors. It's actually to operate them and to process the data we generate. Okay. Photon number resolution also with high fidelity remains a, cha a challenge that we really need to come up with new, new schemes. And also uh, we're using different materials. And over the past 20 years, this has been evolving, but we still maybe possibly could identify better materials for all these detectors. And this takes me to the end, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. Um, um, I think in the uh, we have certainly some questions, indeed, also from the audience. Wonderful. And uh, yeah, we have definitely seen um, now talked about um, lasers, and of course, they generate photons, and now we need to detect photons at the uh, single photon level. Um, uh, I think uh, we have just have um, about 15 minutes left. I think at this point, let uh, let us move on to um, um, the next speaker and uh, hold the question for the end. Thank you very much, Val. Appreciate it. Great. Wonderful. Really, really, like really exciting work with like very short, short uh, 
um, picosecond delayed uh, detectors. Wonderful. Um, all right, uh, moving uh, to our uh, final um, speaker, I'd like to introduce um, Eleni Diamanti. She is a um, uh, running a group at the French National uh, Center for Scientific Research and is currently serving as the Vice Director of the Paris Center for Quantum Computing. Um, Eleni, I would be happy to have you and we can see your screen and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Volker. Uh, it has been a pleasure to participate in this uh, roadmap and uh, thank you for the invitation to this webinar um, on the peak um, um, uh, challenges and perspectives uh, for uh, several areas across quantum technology. So I'll be focusing more on quantum communication networks and cryptography a bit on the system level. So let me give you some general introduction. Um, so just to make sure that we're all on the same page, the quantum communications uh, network, what it does a bit like a normal classical information network, it connects quantum systems that can be sensors, memories, quantum processors, or simply devices that generate or measure quantum states to exchange data. And the general application perspective is to demonstrate a quantum advantage in security efficiency of computation for specific tasks. So let us see a few of these tasks. These are some applications of quantum communication networks. I'm showing here a roadmap towards the quantum internet where you see on the bottom a bit where we are today. Um, so at the stages of the quantum network where we know how to do trusted node networks and prepare and measure states. And then we are progressively adding entanglement and storage and going up to quantum computers. And then on the right, you see the cryptographic and communication applications that these um, stages of the quantum network gives access to. So you will notice that one of the major applications that we have access today is um, quantum key distribution. And I'm going to add to this also random number generation, quantum random number generation, which is one of the main applications of quantum cryptography as well. Um, so I will focus a little bit this presentation on this, uh, on this presentation, on this application. So this also leads me to the technological evolution that is happening uh, as a sort of forecast that we also included in the roadmap, where you see that presently we're at the stage where we have gone beyond the proof of principle uh, for QRNG and QKD. Um, so you see here, for example, that we have some early commercial systems in this uh, in this application. So for example, you see um, a system, a QKD system by the company ID Quantic and a peak based quantum random generator from, um, from the Spanish company, QSide. Um, and we are leading um, with presently, in, with, within a few years, into more mature technology and a higher degree of integration. Where integration here means in a more of a lower level, the system integration, including photonic, but also network integration and cryptographic integration. And then in the next few years, we'll advance in more quantum cryptographic applications and eventually in 10, 15 years towards quantum repeaters and the quantum internet. Um, so let's talk a bit more about QKD. So this is the flagship application of quantum communication. You, Alice and Bob here are connected by a quantum channel where we're using photonic, um, photonic uh, states to encode uh, the key information. And, and the Alice and Bob are also connected through a classical authentication channel. And the idea here is time to quantum mechanics, it is possible to detect, de detect eavesdropping. So essentially what QKD does it enables the exchange of sensitive data with two very important characteristics in the information security field, which is that we have information theoretic security, which means that we don't have to make any computational assumptions on each property, and also long-term security, which essentially protects against the store now and the crypt later type of attacks that can be extremely dangerous. Um, so this is a, the performance in practice. So, so what matters in a QKD system is a secret key generation rate as a function of distance, which can be expressed in optical fiber in this case, but it can also be satellite channels or free space channels or loss, depending on the link that is used. And you will see here that there are several protocols that cover the same functionality that allow for this key distribution and also that there are fundamental limits in rate and range. So this brings me to practical challenges in the field. First of all, the cost. So, and this is where photonic integration comes into the picture that allows us to offer scalability, interconnectivity, reliability. I don't need to convince this audience, but it's obvious that we have lots of to gain in such systems by photonic integration. 
But I would like also to point out some other challenges on which the field people in the field are working on, which is network integration, standards and certification, and also, of course, this um, getting over this range limitation. This is due to optical fiber loss by networks and satellite communications. So let me show you some examples of what the community has been doing uh, for um, uh, in this field on uh, on chip based. So first of all, there is the discrete variable PKD protocols where we encode in properties of simple photons or much more often in weak coherent states for these particular applications. And we need, of course, single photon detectors, which is what we've seen in the previous discussion, in the previous presentation by Val. Um, there is a few major protocols, what is called the decoy state BB84, which is a prepared and measure. So I'll send coherent states to Bob. And these are record breaking implementations at pretty high PRL. And there is also the measurement device independent or, or the so called twin field, um, where we have Alice and Bob sending at a joint station measurements. And this is compatible with some star topology because we use this relay. Um, and it also gives you resilience to detector cyton because this relay node, node can be untrusted and also pretty loss resilient. So in this field, in the DVQKD, one of the most advanced applications of demonstrations is the one that has just been published a few days ago um, by our colleagues from Toshiba UK, um, which, uh, who implemented a full surface standard, a full system, picture-based system has been implemented and you see it for a decoy state protocol. So you see here a transmitter that is based on intim phosphide and the same for the QRNG, a silicon-based receiver, and of course, the detectors are of chip, which is the of chip, which is the major characteristic of single photon detectors. So this was a nice uh, demonstration, uh, demonstrating the potential of um, PIC based PKV system. I am also noting here implementations of measurement device independent PKV, which is applicable to long distances from Bristol on indium phosphide and from uh, from KFA in China again on silicon. On silicon sorry. So, so you see here that both these platforms, and here, of course, in silicon, the lasers are also outside. So you see that the, essentially the chips here are used, are used only for the modulating, uh, uh, so for the transmitter, the transmitter uh, um, needs of, of this protocol. Um, another technology that is very much used is CVQKD, continuous variable QKD, where the encoding is happening in quadratures of the electromagnetic field. Here we're using coherent detectors, and these technologies are compatible uh, with telecom uh, um, with telecom networks, so telecom technology, and this is why they are particularly popular um, and 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 useful for this type of applications and uh, for where we typically a little bit shorter distances than discrete variable PKD, but with a very good um, integration capacity, both at the photonic level and at the network level. Here I'm going to show you an example of how such a system, a uh, proof of principle integrated system has been shown by our colleagues in Singapore on this CVQKD protocol. And this is silicon. Again, the laser is of chip, but the detectors here, and what this is important, contrary to the discrete variable case where it is not possible to integrate single photon detectors, in this case, it is possible. And so this is the, the type of things that they have shown. In Europe, we have a very big activity in this direction as well. So the one of the European quantum flagship projects that is called CIVIC, where we are collaborating in Paris with Barcelona and with the Prime Hofer Institute HHI, we have built a number of, uh, of, um, of uh, chip components and subsystems for transmitter based on indium phosphide. We also have uh, um, indium phosphide receiver, high speed receiver, homodyne detector, and silicon re receiver that we have built here in Paris. This is the one that uh, we have in my lab. And you see here that we show the typical um, linear uh, operation, but on short noise limited uh, performance that is expected from such an on chip homodyne detector with a clearance that can go up to 15 dB. Um, for a bandwidth that is limited to about um, five megahertz, so this is this demonstrates short-range limited operation, which is compatible for CVQKD for these on-chip detectors, which is um, which is major uh, attribute of uh, for CVQKD operation, and we are currently in the process of putting the transmitter and the receiver together to demonstrate to, to perform a full uh, system operation of CVQKD. Um, I will not spend, in the interest of time, I will not spend much time on advanced functionalities. I would like to point out 
some work that has happened in, uh, from our colleagues in Padova, where they had shown free space daylight field experiment with silicon peaks. And this is important because of this, this is a, um, an experiment that opens the way uh, to possible implementation of satellite links. And I remind you that this is extremely important. Satellite links are, are extremely important of going further to a global quantum communication infrastructure. Um, there is also work on uh, within another quantum flaxi project, the Unicorn, on hybrid peaks. Um, so the one that I show you here is from time being and entanglement. And I'm also showing you an example of an alga seed for polarization entanglement that we did here together with my colleague Sarah Ducci from the University of Paris, where we use this chip um, to actually demonstrate, um, again, at the system level, a BBM92, the demonstration of entanglement-based PKD protocol and also entanglement distribution over a fully connected network. And, and finally, there are some, there are some efforts for own chip store, storage, but I would say, for example, here in Caltech, but I would say that this uh, type of, uh, of implementation, so own chip uh, uh, memories and repeaters are still a long time ahead. Um, so I'm going to conclude with some perspective and sciences. Um, so quantum communication networks will be part of the future quantum safe infrastructure. Um, there is a number of use cases uh, going throughout uh, spanning uh, multiple fields where high security requirements are required, and multiple configurations where you may need you may need small volume, for example, or very big scalability. It can be for data centers, it can be for medical files, for government communications, it can be long distance or short distance, depending of these configurations. And what is important is that the photonic integration circuits enable robust, flexible subsystems that can integrate at least partly for some cryptographic functionalities. Um, as you see, the, the field is advancing a lot, but there is quite a few of challenges ahead. First of all, the performance in general is not currently comparable with non-peak based systems. So this is one of the major challenges that we need to push. This includes, of course, being able to perform single photon detection on chip, like the one that Valve was showing. Low loss chip coupling is important. Narrow line width lasers, this is especially for CVQKD. And quantum memories, etc., for the future quantum internet. And um, we also are all our community, especially here in Europe, we have identified big challenges like packaging support, manufacturing tolerances, and very long cycle times that we believe that this should be shortened. Um, we also um, underline the importance of heterogeneous integration and the capacity possible to have hybrid uh, foundries that can that can perform integration with different platforms. Electronic co-integration with the photonic chips is a major challenge as well. And I also and I also underline space qualification as we are in the road uh, towards future uh, global uh, global infrastructure. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and I'm open to any questions. Well, thank you, thank you, Eleni. Wonderful. Um, this is this is fantastic. Um, um, yeah, um, I think I think you very much outlined the um, the next directions. Um, in fact, one of the questions we still had in the sort of like I guess less than sixty seconds left um, um, was sort of like outlining challenges and directions um, as next steps, um, um, like, like 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 beyond this. Um, but since since we are pretty much at the hour here. Um, 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 I think um, it is a uh, was really wonderful to have every one of you um, presenting um, again. Um, Gal Moody and John Bowers from UCSB, Valsler from um, KTH, and Lenny Yu from uh, from France. Um, so that's like the it's very exciting, very very like very great directions. It's very promising. There's certainly unsolved challenges as well, manufacturing integration, um, and um, yeah, looking forward to this uh, comments uh, online. And with this, I'd like to thank everybody. Thank you, um, Journal of Physics Photonics, for hosting this. And um, not to cut it too short, um, I think that's why basically where we leave it out, um, like right here. Thank you for attending um, and have a wonderful day and a wonderful um, wherever you are. Thank you. <laughs>